Welcome to the Zoom and YouTube audience. I'm Greg Murkowski, I'm one of the organizers. Tonight's talk is in battling for a deep fake dystopia. The speaker is Dr. Iki Demir, a senior staff research scientist, Intel Corporation. Our group is the San Francisco Bay Area ACM or Association of Computing Machinery. We're a local professional chapter that was founded in 1957. Our objective is to promote knowledge of modern computing. We want to create community, support networking and hiring. We have only a $20 annual membership. We have upcoming talks on our meetup and we have about 185 past talks on our YouTube. Those are just our most recent talks. We generally have two monthly meetings. There's a general computing talk uh, by default on the third Wednesday of the month and a data science SIG or special interest group, typically on the fourth Monday of the month. We like to focus on networking, job hiring announcements. We work sometimes on joint meeting schedules with other societies such as IEEE or valleyml.ai. Some of our upcoming events on Wednesday, October 6th and Thursday, October 7th, there's full day events. It's for the Transform X AI conference. Some of the speakers include Andrew Ng, uh, Fifi Lee, and about 100 plus speakers. This is a joint eight event between the San Francisco Bay Area ACM and AI Camp. This is a free event. So you can find it on the Meetup site, take a screenshot if you like. And you can also find the agenda at scale.com events Transform X. Then we have a pair of related events coming up in uh, for the data science. The next one is usually on the fourth Monday of the month. So this will be October 25th. A petabyte per second of SQL queries and transactions on a data lake. This is with open source software. Uh, Dave Nielsen and other people from Dreamio. So the Monday talk will be uh, like a free hour and a half or so talk like this one. And then there'll be a follow up and we're still setting it up. I, maybe it's gonna be mid November for a day long class. So that'll be a charge that'll be likely $125. So this will be a, over an eight hour period, um, six hours of training time with uh, different breaks and hands-on labs. So it'll be how to use the tools and how to architect a minimum value project. Uh, so you can use chat and Zoom. If there's any questions to the speaker, go ahead and uh, type the questions there on the moderator and I'll bring up the questions to the speaker. You can also chat in Zoom if there's any technical issues. If you want to announce, like if you're a hiring manager or you know your company's hiring for some kind of data science related job, then you could post that in there. I won't be announcing those, but the other people can be reading them on the chat. And we'd like to support the hiring and the networking. Normally when we had our in-person meetings then I would go around the room and invite uh, people in different sections of the room to do the job hiring announcements or announce if they have other events of interest. Tonight's talk, so the subject is uh, generative models enable an exponential rise of fake content, notification over uh, 680,000 women, impersonation scams worth millions of dollars. Uh, political misinformation is part of a deep fake dystopia. Uh, deep fakes depend on the photorealism. We can't always tell if it's a fake or humans can't always tell. A fake catcher or some software it can detect synthetic content using things like heartbeats, there's uh, detectors uh, blindly using deep learning may not be as effective. Uh, key assertion is signals hidden in videos can identify the authenticity. There's robust detection with heartbeat, PPG, eye virgins, gaze movements. Um, she's uh, based in Hermosa Beach, California. She has uh, research in the overlap of computer vision and machine learning, focuses on generative models, deep fake detection, geospatial machine learning and computational geometry. She has her PhD in computer science from Purdue University with a dissertation that conceives geometric and topological shape processing approaches for reconstruction and modeling. She's con contributed to several animated and VR AR uh, movies, pixel shorts and uh, pixel animation, or I'm sorry, Pixar animation studios and Intel studios. So please help me have a, a warm welcome for Dr. Iki Demir, and I'll turn it over to her now. Thank you. Thanks for the very nice introduction. I will share my slides and we can start. This is a deep fake with my voice and Nicolas Cage's face. 
and there are thousands of others on the internet. How can we trust our eyes in a world of synthetic media? So thanks, Deepfake Inke. Uh, as you saw, that was a Deepak of me, uh, quite convincing, I guess. And there are better versions of that, of course. Um, so welcome to my talk about building trust in the synthetic world. Uh, I'm Ilke Demir, as introduced, and today I will introduce our responsible AI approaches against the uh, deepfake dystopia. So uh, before we start, I would like to thank ACM uh, San Francisco chapter for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, this talk is made possible by ACM Distinguished Speakers Program uh, with a mission to help competing professionals to connect, create, and advance together. For more information and other exciting lectures, you can check out the program. And now we can start. And before actually jumping to deep fakes, we can go back to the basics. Um, probably most of the data science and uh, machine learning folks know this, but just like uh, giving a brief uh, overview. So when dealing with visual data, we can broadly categorize the deep models uh, into discriminative and generative models. So this discriminative models uh, ask that question, what is this? Given the data, how can we categorize, recognize, um, extract what is in the data? Is there a cat? What can we extract from data? That is the main question for discriminative models. For generative models on the other side, um, they ask the question, this is what? I know this is kind of the reverse, but in other words, um, what is the generalized version of this? Can we learn the distribution of whatever is given from the given samples? So for generative models, we want to go beyond associating, associating inputs to outputs, and we want to understand high dimensional complex probability distributions. We want to discover the true structure of the data. Um, maybe we want to detect surprising events in the world and uh, try to be able to generate them. We want to um, find missing data or generate mo models for planning. So deep generative models have three main um, architectures, um, although uh, more has been experimented recently. So autoregressive models, where model conditional probabilities are explicitly modeled. There are variation autoencoders, which tries to minimize the convergence of the learned distribution to the given distribution. And generative adversarial networks, or GANs, as we all know, uh, which is like a game between two networks where the generator and the discriminator tries to convince each other that the generator samples are realistic in the case of generator or not realistic enough in the case of the discriminator. So as we are now in the AI era, all these technological and computational advancements lead us to encounter realistic synthetic worlds, increasing in both quantity and quality. For example, LSGAN, PGGAN, VGAN, CycleGAN, all these different loss, met, uh, loss functions and different architectures enable generative adversarial networks to make it commonly available and efficient to train new deep, learn, new deep learning models on even more and more data. So such democratization of AI enable deepfakes. Deepfakes are synthetic images or videos created by advanced methods where the actor or the action of the actor is not real. As you can see in this compilation, initially they were used for photorealistic avatars, AR, VR applications, actor, actor retargeting, etc. But uh, now we can uh, have control over all of these models, such as like changing the age, changing the gender, changing the head pose, and uh, we can generate deepfakes on the fly. So although this technology has been developed with positive intent, it also attracted malicious users to exploit deepfakes for political misinformation, impersonation, forgery, and pornography. The more we see them online, the more we hesitate to trust any media content, like whoever shares, wherever it is shared, we don't trust it, right? So this threat to the information integrity has consequences in privacy, law, politics, security, policy, and eventually it poses a threat to form social erosion of trust. As a defense mechanism, researchers uh, introduced several defect detection methods investigating different data and image-based representations including compression artifacts or histograms or different feature representations. Um, on the other hand, 
um, those representations or features are used to, uh, on the other hand, there are like signal domain, which is like either um, the uh, signal spectra or temporal signals or biological signals, etc. And then those representations or features or signals are used to train a neural model such as a CNN or a, a variational to encoder. Um, in, there's also another approach. So in the existence of a large corpus of data, um, similarity search or history lookups are also used if the content is a derivative of some prior media. Um, then like either both of the techniques, uh, there's the end classification uh, for whether real or fake, the media is real or fake. And in general, like most of the models and representations that I talked about, um, utilize saturation cues, compression artifacts, inconsistent head poses, blinks, face warping art artifacts, or biological signals. Um, most of these approaches define the problem as a binary real versus fake classification solely based on images or videos and the uh, um, artifacts of fakery without an explicit authentication, uh, authenticity or fakeness domain. So today our focus is on deep biological detectors to find the authenticity cues instead of fakeness cues. So I was, oh, sorry, I will start by introducing Fake Catcher, um, our renowned, uh, world renowned defect detection algorithm. You have probably seen in uh, seen it in any of these like news articles in your language, uh, but we will dive deeper and explore newer technologies built upon, upon it. The intuition behind Fake Catcher is simple. Um, most of the detection techniques are searching for artifacts of fakery. Instead, we ask the question, is there any intrinsic watermarks of being human? Is there a unique authenticity signature in real videos? Well, if you have watched the OA, uh, Dr. Hap mentions that heartbeats are like signatures for people. Should we believe him or why is this even relevant in this part of the presentation? Well, the answer to the previous question is yes. So as our heart pumps blood, it causes our veins to hold oxygen, which causes subtle color and motion changes on our skin. These cha changes can be detected as signals, and the color change is called photoplatysmography, PPG, and the motion change is called ballistocardiography, BCD. These signals are invisible to the eye, so even if you are looking to my face, you cannot see them, but computationally, they are visible. That being said, let's look at the PPG signals on a sample pair of real and fake videos. As you see in these graphs, uh, PPG variants behave differently for original and synthetic uh, videos, and they are represented as solid, solid and dashed lines. So the first question we ask here is, um, given n, pair of, n pairs of fake and real videos, can we find an implicit, in, implicit indicator of biological signals? This is, all, this is like the pairwise separation. I just give you that give them uh, as pairs, and you say which one is fake, which one is real. Uh, a question from the audience, Edward, um, to read his question. May I assume that the signal being faked are not limited just to visual, meaning graphics and videos and sound, but other biometrics, pupils, fingerprints, and so on? So he's just asking if there's other things being faked. Um, for this presentation, it is just visual. So because we are looking at the fakes, but um, there is like forgery in biological domain for fingerprints, pupils, for other, for sound, for um, there is uh, uh, voice deep fakes, etc. So um, still deep fakes is mostly attributed to image and video, uh, but some audio deep fakes also emerge. And there's also like, um, like other biological, uh, bio, uh, other biometric signals that are uh, forged. So, uh, but for the sake of this presentation, we are looking, we are looking only for the um, uh, image domain, okay. uh, video domain. And a question from me is, I assume you have to be close enough or have enough resolution to detect the, the heartbeats or the different biological symbols uh, or signals. You know, there must be some kind of distance or resolution where if that person is like so far away, their face isn't filling up the full screen, but maybe they're 10% of the screen, then the ability to detect would start to drop or go down. 
Right. Um, I will go to those in the ablation studies about how much, uh, what region of the face we need, like how much we need, etc. So if you can hold that question for a second, yes, of course, there are limitations and I will go through that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Sure. So in the pairwise setting, uh, we did many experiments. You can check the paper for those experiments. We looked at the, their temporal correlation. We looked at different PBG signals. We looked at uh, PBG signals from different uh, parts of the face, et cetera. Um, and at the end, we found out that for the uh, pairwise separation, uh, I'm sorry, for the pairwise um, separation problem, the cross-spectral densities, oh, there was an animation here. Yes, okay. <laughs> the pairwise cross-spectral densities actually give us 99.39% accuracy. Um, so this is just like for with some signal correlation from different PPGs, we can actually find that the real the signals from the real videos correlate much more than the signals in the fake videos. So in the pairwise separation setting, we can have this high accuracy with no learning, no like um, uh, complex, uh, this is just like an implicit function of stimulus. But that is the pairwise separation. So if we go back to the original question, given any video, can we find whether it is fake or real? Uh, we can try to use the same cross-spectral densities, right, of the PPG signals. And uh, we again did some uh, feature collection from the signals and from the spectra and temporal signals, et cetera. And we, as, as our domain is kind of more interpretable in the PPG domain, uh, we used an SVM uh, to train and uh, find out in the generalized setting. But um, even with the like, very best combination of those signals, we had 75% accuracy uh, on the same data set in the generalized setting. And which is not really good, right? Like, yeah, um, it's like, just um, imagine looking at four Johnny Depp videos and I product all of them are fake and one of them is actually real. So which is, which is not that good, uh, uh, not an optimum setting. So we, we um, explored the space um, as we are using like kind of interpretable features. We wanted to understand the feature space. So we applied some source separation techniques such as PCA, LDA, CSP, and the uh, principal components, the dominant uh, features were not as representative as we wanted. So we kind of concluded that the solution space was not linearly independent and high dimensional. So we started by a very simple three layer neural network, which gave 96% accuracy on, on the same data set. So that is like a kind, kind of accuracy that we want to achieve, right? Like very high accuracy. I mean, considerably high accuracy. Of course, like high accuracy on one data set uh, alone is not enough to validate pet catcher. So we evaluated it, evaluated it on four different data sets with additional uh, cross model and cross data set settings with additional uh, post-processing artifacts in temporal domain and in uh, image domain with Gaussian blurs, with, uh, with uh, 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 some other kinds of noise with frame uh, interchange, etc. And even in those cases, we found out that, like, of course, the algorithm, uh, algorithm is uh, affected, but not as affected as uh, most of the other uh, approaches. We also um, uh, conclude that even for in the wild videos, uh, which is a scientific way of saying, have you seen the latest data fake of that celebrity on YouTube, right? Even in that setting, uh, we have 91.07% accuracy, which sheds some light for the future. Yeah, so um, you can check the paper for more um, experiments. Coming back to the question of faces, uh, we experimented with different facial regions and how much uh, we need. So even for the smallest cases, um, we saw that uh, for different windows uh, sizes and for different um, segments, we saw that we have okay accuracy even with those like very little segments. And these have like um, 356 pixels, uh, but that is actually, um, not the number of like, this is four, uh, times the um, uh, window length. So this is like uh, just a few pixels uh, in, in per frame. Um, and in this case, we found out that like this, this um, mid configuration for the face sizes was uh, giving the best accuracy. But of course the others also, uh, also um, give okay accuracy if, if, as long as we have some pixels to um, extract uh, PPG signals. Um, in in um, 
in about 10 slides, you will see in the pipeline how we uh, use uh, and rectify the facial region. So in that case, it will be more, more clear why we uh, why this is um, still okay if we don't have if, if we don't have enough pixels. We will go there. Uh, we also compare two baseline methods with complex network architectures, such as exception, and we beat them with more than 8% accuracy uh, difference uh, uh, by, with fake catch. A question from the audience, and maybe this is something you'll cover later with, um, what, that by Dave. What's the most famous case of a fake video that you're aware of? Um, I think the there are many versions of it, but like Obama saying not good things or saying that oh like this this is not a um, uh, this is not something that Obama should say. What I'm saying this variance of that Obama video is the I think most famous case of deepfakes. Um, we so because of some reasons we are not allowed to show the uh, some videos that are not in our data set. Uh, and they are not approved, but I would love to solve it. You, you can just like Google it, uh, look it on YouTube, I guess. That's fine. Um, and then a second question from Dave. Today, what is the main motivation of people making fake videos? Yeah, um, so there are some studies and market analysis about that. And very unfortunately, the um, according to a 2019 report, um, over 97% of deepfakes are in um, uh, adult content, in, in, in pornography, um, which is like even there are some, I guess there are some mm. services that um, you give mm. the video and the face of someone and that is like automatically mm. creating the deepfake that you want and the video, of course, it is like um, like nude videos, etc. but the actual uh, face you give, it's not nude, etc. Anyway, so like um, that is unfortunately the main use case um, nowadays. Um, of course, there are also other use cases such as um, I mentioned in the beginning. Um, there was also like, for example, a Telegram bot uh, that was like you send the payment, you send the picture, and you get the new version version of the picture. Um, there is a case where a startup um, CEO or some someone like that I I don't remember the details I'm really sorry um, was um, convinced that it was someone else so that they actually got this much money by just like a synthetic voice for example. Um, even there are some cases in uh, courts saying that like um, um, proposing like fake court evidences and in that case they need like really good experts saying that this is a deep fake or not because it's a little bit different from normal image forgery in image forgery like there are like artifacts you, there are automatic automated processes that you can find whether it is photoshopped or not uh, but in in deep fakes they are there is a struggle about saying whether it is a deep fake court evidence or not so those are the main uh, motivation unfortunately right now. Okay. Uh, last question is, if a woman's wearing makeup, uh, wouldn't that prevent some skin color detection from changing with her heartbeat? Or would that cause any effects? So um, I hope, uh, Dave, Dave, uh, please wait for 20 slides <laughs> to come back to that question, because <laughs> um, I, will, I, will, I will show that. OK, yeah. thank you. Yeah. OK, so uh, back to the data set. For fake catcher and future defect detection research, uh, we also release our defects in the wild data set to serve as a benchmark. Um, it includes real world cases like unknown generators, compression, occlusion, motion, makeup, and illumination artifacts. So if something is given, if a detector is giving high accuracy on defects in the wild data set, that is more reflecting the real world case of detection. Um, and uh, happily, <laughs> we, uh, the trusted media team at Intel, we developed the first real-time defect detection platform based on um, Intel optimization. So uh, the, uh, we first decode and pre-process the video with GStreamer video analytics pipeline. Then there is a face and landmark detection, which is also real-time based on um, Intel optimized OpenVINO models. Then we run the fake catcher core to create the PPG maps. Uh, 
um, and we get the classification results, uh, which is also um, converted to an open media model. Then we encode it for streaming. So when I show it like that, it's a, it may look like a boring pipeline, but let's look at the video. Sorry, this, okay, crashed, okay. Yeah, so this is uh, our demo. So as you see, um, it is usually real time, but my PowerPoint is not <laughs> is not playing it uh, as real time, I guess. So anyway, so you can see that there is the uh, uh, segment label, there is the video label, um, then you can see the confidences about each uh, each um, segment. Uh, we have the frames per second, we have the confidence uh, per segment, and you can also select like other videos and or you can upload your video and you can get like real time defect detection results, which is a very nice um, way to approach the problem because like it's not like you do that very complicated analysis and um, uh, wait for the results and retrain something etc. So um, all of these videos are actually like uh, almost none of these videos um, are in the actual training set, but we can still have um, high accuracy. So this is like the most generalized version that is out yet. Um, if you are interested in the demo, contact me afterwards. Um, so let's continue. Um, now I want to pose another question. Okay, fake catcher may inform you um, whether a video is fake or not, but where do these fakes come from? For example, the uh, related to the question that just, just came, right? What is the motivation or who is actually doing that? Or which GAN actually created this deep fake? Can fake catcher find their source? In the literature, there are several artic articles that propose that generative models uh, leave some residue, which can be interpreted as their fingerprint. These fingerprints, this residue, and say whether it comes from program one or program two, or um, they can try to look at like whether something comes from, in the image domain, it comes from StarGAN or StyleGAN or StyleGAN2, et cetera. Um, so by a set of, um, they mostly in the, investigate the image domain and try to classify the generative noise blindly by a set of known models like ProGAN, StarGAN, StyleGAN. But what about our domain of face videos, right? Can we do source detection for defects? So in contrast to fake catcher, uh, we want to interpret generative residue of specific models as a deformation in the biological signals. So if you look at these mean images from the videos um, for four for four um, GANs for different kind of deep fakes and the real one, you can obviously see that the residue changes, right? Like for example, face-to-face -face has more difference in, uh, in lips area, whereas deep fakes is more um, higher contrast uh, differences, et cetera. And if you actually uh, project these differences into the biological domain, the PPG maps look much more different than a, a much more different than the mean uh, images, right? So this gives us some uh, uh, confidence about like if we can do a source detection in the PPG domain. So with a similar approach to fake catcher, we extract PPG cells, do a classification. Um, and the network is a little bit more complex because not, we are not doing binary but multi-class classification and then we aggregate to the odds. So we will go through the pipeline quickly. Starting with the video, we extract the frames, of course. Then we uh, gather all those frames into an omega length windows or segments as I have been uh, calling them. Then we extract the faces from those videos sorry, segments, and we extract the regions of interests from those. Then we align them and rectify them. So back to the question of uh, how much resolution we need. After we do the rectification uh, by a nonlinear affine transformation, we actually divide that into delta equals square, squares per frame. So ideally, um, each of these uh, squares, each of these grid cells should be at least one pixel. So that gives a little bit of flexibility on our approach because this delta is actually just a parameter of the system. So if we want to divide it to like four by four, that would be okay. Or if we want to divide it by 32 or 32 by 32, that's also fine. Um, so of course that kind of diminishes the information that we are getting from there, but instead of having uh, like some blurred signals, this is actually a better uh, indication as long as the alignment and rectification are actually in good shape. So um, we can 
uh, work in different resolutions as the approach is flexible, but of course there is some, some in information missing there. So- Is there, oh, yeah. is there object tracking on face key points over frames or it's just one frame at a time analysis? We are doing, uh, we are not doing tracking, we are doing uh, face and landmark extraction from every frame. That being said, that is actually different for different. So um, the approach that I'm explaining right now is the original one, not the optimized one. Here we are doing face detection and landmark detection from each uh, frame. But in the optimized pipeline, uh, we are actually changing between detection and tracking because we want to make it real time. So if you want to make it real time, you can actually um, trust a little bit of, a little bit more on tracking and um, you don't need to run detection every frame. Is it? Yes, thank you. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, cool. So um, after we have those like uh, data, square, uh, data squares per frame, we extract cron PPG values from each signal. And this is uh, remember through segments. So the signal is actually signal uh, through the through all the segments per each grid cell. Then uh, remember that was per se segment. So we have delta times omega uh, size PPG map, PPG window. And this is only temporal, right? We also want to add the spectral version of that. Of that. So we have two delta per times omega PPG cell. Um, we just then scale to omega uh, to have it like omega by omega. So this is the PPG cell that we are doing uh, or PPG map that we are doing classification on. Then we uh, feed these um, PPG ma maps to a multi-class classification. Uh, we use equal, equally probable classes for generators and real videos for how many generators we have plus the real videos. Um, in, the, in most of the configurations that I will uh, mention in the results, there are four generators from plus and one real class. Uh, we use a VGG19 backbone, similar to VGG19. Um, and we use uh, 128 uh, segment length and uh, 32 um, grid cells. Um, after we do the classification per segment, not each video is a segment, right? We have many different 128 or one, many different 64 frames. So among those, we, look, we use log of odds to classify all of them into, uh, sorry, uh, aggregate all of them into one confidence per video. And that actually helps us a lot when there is like um, high occlusion in the video for one part or for three seconds, maybe like the actor is doing some crazy things and face detection fails. We can still uh, recover from there in the, in the overall video saying that, okay, like three segments of that it's fake. I'm sorry, three segments of it, uh, of, of a video is um, a real one segment is fake then the fake one, it means that there's some, something went bad, right? Um, so if you look at these uh, confusion metrics, um, we can find high with high accuracy, like all, all of the detectors and the real ones. And if you remember the fake catcher accuracy, it was 96%. Now the real class um, has 97% accuracy for fake detection, which is actually a, a improved version for, for fake catcher, right? If we are trying to detect the individual generators and the real one, then our fake detection accuracy actually, uh, our real detection accuracy actually uh, increases. And overall, if you look at the mean, we have 93% source detection accuracy. Now, there is a, a much uh, nicer <laughs> um, experiment in this side, so um, in addition to these five classes, we retrain the model with thousand um, samples from CelebDF, which is a completely different data set with a different generator, um, different videos, et cetera. We only take thousand fakes of it. We don't see the, the, the model, um, never sees the originals of CelebDF. It just sees like 1,000 uh, fakes of fakes from that data set as a sixth class. Then we retrain it and um, in the test uh, and, and um, measure the video accuracy on the test data set. And we still have 93% accuracy, which was like, it even increased a little bit, right? And in the new one, we have like 92% accuracy in the CelebDF. So this actually gives us hope about um, 
Without the need of the originals for one generator, we can still find the fakes. If we have some samples of that fake, we can still do source detection with similar accuracy without the dependence on the real ones. We also did more ablation studies. Uh, we looked uh, about what happens if we um, do only uh, if we only classify the fakes without the real class. The accuracy is similar. If we only do uh, on temporal, not without the spectra, uh, it drops a little bit. If we don't do PPG but only do face classification, it drops significantly, and full frame is bad. <laughs> we also looked at the uh, segment windows. Um, so in this in for fake catcher ca fake case, um, 128 segments were giving better accuracy. But here um, now we need more granular information because we are not aggregating everything together, right? Like we need we have more more variance between classes. So here we use 64 frame uh, segments, uh, which gives the highest accuracy. Um, I will skip this ex experiment for the sake of the time and continue. OK. Um, so we talked about, uh, coming back to the makeup question, we talked about uh, heart rate and PPG signals uh, for fake detection. Is there um, other? biological signals that we can use for deepfakes where the um, skin-based ones fail. What about the eyes? So as the eyes are the mirror to the soul, <laughs> we investigate the truth in the eyes of deepfakes. So comparing the real eyes here to the fake ones here, we observe that uh, there are significant visual um artifacts as you can see here and moreover like these visual artifacts between left and right eyes uh are actually inconsistent so even if the real ones are more consistent the fake ones between both eyes are uh there are like um, causing broken symmetries in addition um anomaly occurs in gaze behavior too not only like visual eye behavior but also the gaze behavior so normally humans when we look somewhere uh, our eyes converge Okay. Of course, there are some um, like um, um, irregular eye conditions. I'm excluding them. I'm sorry <laughs> for now. Uh, but like normally, humans, when we look at somewhere, we are eyes commerce. Even if it's in distance, uh, in even the object uh, is uh, like very far far away. Our eyes, our gazes are coplanar. They are not like this. Okay. Uh, but for for fake eyes. Um, even if the direction is correct, the uh, sorry, even if the um, uh, eyes are um, like looking kind of OK, they, their gaze vectors are um, either divergent or they are off plane. So they are not convert, convergent, convert, converging on a point. And if you try to uh, find uh, even if the uh, if even if their uh, direction is corrected, the continuum of 3D vergence points is broken. So they have uh, like noisy um, uh, gaze paths in 3D. They are missing some paths. They are missing some saccades. So if if the normal gazes are looking like this, like there is a consistent jump in the saccade, uh, but in the fake gazes there is no such consistent consistency, and the three divergence points are non-uniform. So this is like a really nice signal that we can use for finding fake fake eyes. Um, we also evaluate their properties in temporal domain for fake and real videos. For example, real gazes cover more vertical and horizontal range than fake ones, or uh, fake gazes have shaking like noise. They are not like, they are looking like this. Um, or the fake iris sizes can differ by 30 millimeters square and the pupil sizes by 40 millimeters square for the same person, which is not realistic, right? Like your, your eye, your pupil, like, uh, of course, in um, when there is light, when we focus, etc., they change, but they don't change that much. So you can see here, like the um, orange ones are actually how the pupil sizes change versus the green ones, which are very small for real ones, which are more realistic. And such signals properties are also detectable in the spectral domain. So we formulate all of these visual, geometric, metric, uh, temporal, and spectral features to gather all eye and gaze-related consistency and coherence measures together. Then we create gaze signatures from these features um, 
that looks like this. These look like our PPG maps, right? Like, but uh, they're again like the temporal part, the spectral part, and uh, this is like the eye signature. If the previous one was like PPG was our like heart rate signature, this is like the eye and gaze signature. So looking closer to the signature, some significant differences of real and fake videos are visible. Uh, for example, PSDs are like very different. Uh, you see like this is much more colorful in the fake one. This is much more like uh, darker, not like less variants, etc. And then we feed these gaze signatures into a simple network. And uh, we have the, uh, again, we have the comfort of training a simple network due to the power of representation of, uh, of gaze signatures here. Um, so we don't need that very complex uh, feature generation part. We actually know what we are looking for, which is actually based on like the eye physics. Our eye gaze based detection algorithm achieves 99.27% accuracy on deeper forensic data set, which is a newer data set, and it has 92% accuracy on face forensics. Um, if we, of course, convert, uh, compared it to existing algorithms, and it is the second best after fake catcher. If you remember, fake catcher was 96, and now here it is like 92. So we are losing some accuracy. But again, like uh, if you if you imagine like the eyes are, we are just looking at this region, right? Nothing more. For fake catcher, you have the whole skin. Um, we also looked at better and more complex deep networks, and we are uh, we have better accuracy than them. Finally, of course, now I'm coming back to that makeup question. Uh, we compared our approach to fake catching and observed the failure cases are uh, mutually exclusive. So on the left, uh, the eye gaze based classification correctly classifies a fake video and it correctly classifies a real video on the right, whereas fake catcher fails due to physical or digital corruption on skin for both cases. So here, um, there is, uh, I guess, too much makeup to, for us to find the skin and PPG cells uh, properly. And here, the blurriness actually uh, um, makes the PPG signals like intervene so much that it is actually um, a real video, but it is found to be fake. But even in this case, like uh, the gaze vectors are consistent enough for the eye gaze based detection to say, say to classify that it is real. So we um, propose that like there is like, especially for biological signals, um, even though some uh, detectors may say may, may have a high accuracy, if we have ensemble networks that are looking different biological signals from different uh, image uh, areas or different regions, that would give us like the highest confidence. Um, we talked a lot about deep detection, uh, but can we do anything uh, responsible on the generation side to evade a deep fake dystopia? So up to date, all the deep fake uh, generation approaches need a source and a target actor, um, either for reenactment or for mask based mask based generation or for autoencoders, there is the original phase and the reconstructed phase. And there is always like the source and the target where the source is either replaced with the target or reenacted. And that causes the import, the, that causes the, the evil uh, impersonation acts, right? On the other hand, we believe that we can actually make a difference if we can ensure that the generated phase uh, is not one-to-one -one impersonated. So, Let's make a soup of existing humans so that we don't impersonate anyone one to one, right? Um, more formally, in this new approach, we can mix and match different parts from different sources. So the new person is really a new person. It may like it's he, his or her eyes may be similar to, uh, let's say, this uh, image. His uh, or her nose may be similar to this image, but as a whole, it's a new person. So. To, to, and in order to do that, if we copy and paste all those uh, orange areas into a new commas, you will get something like this in the mask domain and something like this in the image domain. It doesn't look like a realistic human anymore. So it's not the, uh, even if your images are like very much aligned and you don't have these artifacts, this is not a, a, a good way to do by like ro robust uh, copy paste or robust uh, blending. However, um, Using our multi-source face synthesis model, we can obtain this new <laughs> lovely fake lady 
where the eyes come from this image and nose from this image and face from this image, um, etc. And if you can, uh, if you see, like uh, we actually enable this by creating this fuzzy mask, right, which is a learned mask from the combination of these masks. So without uh, going into much details, we use a structure generator uh, where we encode all of these different parts by an encoder. Then our decoder decomposes, in, decomposes it into a known and random uh, combinations. Then the discriminator is trying to find whether it is a realistic mask or not. So these um, four uh, regions are combined into this one, for example. The hair is preserved very well, the mouth is pre preserved. And you see they are not exactly at the same place, but they are blending well with the remaining ones. So if you're taking the eyes from the same person, then the eyes would be in focus in the proper ways. I mean, earlier you were doing eye detection based on where the eyes were purposed, but if you're taking um, the eyes from the same person, then, then that uh, detection wouldn't work. Is that correct? That's true. If you are preserving the eyes, yes. And actually, um, I didn't show it, but uh, maybe I can go back if I have that. Yeah. So, um, for example, uh, here, um, as much as I know, um, neural textures um, is creating deep fakes or was it face to face? Anyway, I think both of them. <laughs> um, they create deep fakes uh, with masks where they carve out the eyes. So the eyes are actually preserved. So the, just the other parts are actually being replaced. So in that case, our gaze based detection result is actually very low, if you see. It's like 59, which is kind of random ish. I right? 50 is random for like a fake detection. So if the eyes are not generated, of course this won't work. This is on this only works, but it works well if the eyes are also generated. The eyes are also uh, generated, like uh, like deep fakes or uh, face swap. Like the eyes are not preserved in that case. And for um, for this method, um, this is actually an image domain. We haven't applied it to videos yet. This is just for, uh, image generation. So I wouldn't say any, I, I can't say anything about like um, my deep fake detectors working on these. Um, so yeah, the, the structure generators, then uh, we have a style generator where we encode all the segments in the image domain similarly. Um, however, now we use uh, the fuzzy uh, mask that we generate that we have from the structure generators, and we apply the style matrix, which is the learned version of those encoders, and then we create the uh, then the generator creates the images, and the discriminator tries to classify them into fake one. So these um, green humans <laughs> are created by our approach from the areas that are marked with purple. Um, for example, the hair style is kind of different, but it's trying to uh, also put these earrings, which are similar to here, and the smile is preserved like this. Or um, here, even though the eye makeup comes from here, the face comes from here, nose comes from here, et cetera. So as the first multi-source defect generator, we cannot compare it to others, there is none, <laughs> but we compare it to single source ones in an incremental way. So in these uh, first four columns, uh, we try to use the copy-paste copy -paste mask that I showed in the beginning and copy-paste image for these other uh, region-aware uh, or region-based generators to create. Um, the create the, the 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 lady that we created right and the results are not really uh, looking that photorealistic in these um, the last two uh, images we actually apply it like region by region so um, for example we apply sound for um, for hair then we apply sound for the nose then we apply sound for the if we do it in an incremental way uh, for both like mass guided generation and for cell, you can see that the results are a little bit more realistic, but you can still see that the uh, cheeks and the nose is not the same color 
um, the uh, neck is not blending well. Here you can still see that like there is some um, discrepancy in the mustache area, etc. But if you look at ours, um, it looks much more realistic. And of course, this is like all the visual things that I'm explaining, which may be uh, not really uh, um, quant uh, uh, qualitative analysis. So we also looked at the PSNR and RMSC and SSIM and FID scores uh, with the uh, images that we generate and with the versus the images that are generated sequentially by those other GANs. And uh, our results are higher, for, like better for all of them. So what next? Uh, what can we do in 3D, right? Uh, we looked at image domain, we looked at uh, video domain. What can we do in 3D? So um, reanimation, retargeting of uh, 3D digital humans may be the most positive outcome of deepfakes. Uh, you can watch our whole pipeline and AI-based filmmaking tools, as I mentioned in the very first before we started the talk in our previous uh, year's talk, or you can come um, talk with me. Um, we introduced like uh, deep learning models to clean and denoise and segment point clouds, as you see here. Uh, for example, this is a real world um, 3D uh, uh, capture. Um, and we can actually use deep learning to clean these to get this end model. Uh, we can use a, a Automatic tracking, deformation, and morphing tools. We can use super resolution. I don't know why it stopped playing. Okay, yeah. We can use super resolution. Of course, we are not like uh, do, uh, uh, capturing this slowly, but we can actually use like frame, frame interpolation, etc. And maybe another layer of excitement on top of all of these is that our models are in the order of 20 times larger than current state of the art 3D data sets like ShapeNet. So these are like really dense uh, on the order of millions of points per model. So such exciting times to play with AI on humans, right? Uh, that being said, uh, let's summarize today's news. Uh, we showed that defects have alien heartbeats, which enables fake catcher to catch them. In addition, we built an Intel optimized uh, pipeline with uh, OpenVINO AI models on Ice Lake to build the first real time defect detection platform. Then we used the same uh, heartbeat, same PPG signals to track the source generator of defects. Uh, we also enhanced detection with other biological priors, such as eye and gaze consistency. And finally, we shared generation approaches in 2D and 3D for responsible and useful defects. Um, we have maybe the most cross-organizational team at Intel and outside at Intel uh, within the Trusted Media Initiative. So I thank everyone uh, who has been a part of this, who has been a part of a trustful future. And apart from the Intel team, we also, uh, I also want to acknowledge our academic collaborator, Umur Ayavar Shichi, for all the uh, days and nights uh, spent on those projects. And thank you everyone for attending our talk and feel free to reach us, reach me for any more information or for the demo. And I am ready for all the questions. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, so I have some uh, questions. So from uh, Richard, uh, he was asking, isn't this a whack-a-mole problem? Any new parameter that can be detected will be added to the GAN. You know, I think, you know, he's saying that if, if uh, things get more, uh, you know, get more realistic and then you try and uh, train your GAN to separate between the two, uh, kind of like a, a, in a security game where there's more network intrusions and then there's more attacks and defense, attacks, defense kind of whack-a-mole, any comments on that? Yep, yep, uh, yeah. Um, so that is almost always the first question <laughs> I get after this presentation, so I have a slide for that. Um, so for gaze detection, I agree, because what we do in gaze detection is like easy formulation, like if this and that is agreeing each other, right? Like for gaze or for visual, et cetera. But for fake catcher, um, it's not the case yet. So there are three reasons for that. The first one is uh, to incorporate PBG signals into a loss function, PBG extraction needs to be differentiable. And that is mathematically not possible. 
And the second one is mimicking both spatial and temporal consistency of 32 plus PBJ signals is hard. And we can even do that probabilistically. So we can like probabilistic select the same cells from each frame, uh, but per frame, like switch and mix them. So it is easily convertible to an even harder problem where it, there is no GAN that is actually finding which probabilistic, which is coming from, and is it like agreeing, et cetera. So that uh, layer of PPG generation actually makes it a much harder problem. And lastly, um, even if uh, a GAN is not using the exact PPG formulation that we use, but uh, they are like trying to approximate the heartbeat, to try to approximate the PPG generation. Um, that needs like huge PPG grant root data sets to learn it from, to approximate it from, which doesn't exist. There are some little PPG uh, data sets, which is like, when I say grant root data set is like when you put that ping finger into a machine and like your PPG signal is measured, et cetera. It's not like image-based PPG. So uh, there are some small data sets, but there is no like real generalizable PPG approximation as of yet. In that case, like, there is like building again um, that with, with with realistic PPG signals is hard. Okay. Um, another question from Alexis. Uh, could deep fakes one day become so advanced that we won't be able to detect them from uh, fakes? Uh, so, I, and I, I would add to it, you know, I imagine if you get into more kind of 3D physiology modeling or something like that with the heart pumping or the eyes, um, and you know, focusing at the right depth or the right kind of areas. Um, so, any comments on that? Yeah. Um, so, of course, this is a like uh, this is an arms race, right? Um, so, the more biological signals we find, um, as I said, like maybe now we are using eye gaze detection, but maybe our formulation of the detection they will just like put it into again and have very realistic eye gaze. Um, then we will find something else. And uh, actually, there are so many biological signals that are that are left unexplored, for example, breathing, for example, um, like multimodal approaches with your voice and uh, your um, 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 skin uh, vibration. Like there are so many biological signals that are not explored yet. So I foresee that like whenever there is something very realistic, we can still find the biological signal to find that it is not, it is not real. Um, of course, there would be an end to it that like, hopefully um, there will be like very nice ensemble networks that will be like better than generators um, or I don't know uh, maybe another hope that people propose is that um, at that time the legislation of deepfakes will be so advanced that uh, everything will be watermarks and uh, watermarked and uh, everything will be tracked to its origin so we will know if there's a fake where it comes from and it's a fake etc so um, in my team uh, we see it as a uh, we see detection as a short-term solution uh, and uh, provenance will be the longer-term solution where we see, uh, similar to like all the security techniques, all the crypto techniques, we will see an implicit uh, watermarking techniques to all the GANs so that like whenever a GAN uh, creates something, it is actually um, tracked all the way from its origin and it actually contains the information, not as a metadata, but uh, more in a more uh, embedded way. Uh, it contains its data, so it is. It will be known that it's a fake. Okay, yeah, that kind of gets into the next one from Tom Moran. Is there anything cryptographically that can be used to detect the legitimacy of the audio video feed? Um, something like TruePick, but I think you were starting to get into something about the watermarks, and it sounds like a more advanced version of of uh, uh, a checksum kind of thing. But there would be yeah, something yeah, yeah, exactly. to visually see. Yeah, exactly. I think the question has the answer <laughs> in itself. And um, we are actually exploring some of those like watermarking and implicit uh, implicit like provenance techniques that we can use um, to uh, have another view or like another longer term view in this defect problem as from the provenance side. And um, we have a like a secure, uh, we have a, um, large security team that are like uh, interested in this problem. Um, nothing that I can share tangi uh, tangibly right now, but stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Um, a question from Richard Chang. Uh, it's not about fooling everyone, just enough to change the thinking of a targeted audience. That's the dangerous side of deep fake that scientists often ignore. By the time you can prove and convince a target audience that it's fake, 
it might be too late. Uh, so I can't agree more. Yeah, um, whatever complicated tech that we use for deepfake detection, if people want to believe what they want to believe, they won't even use that tool to detect that. And um, maybe for image domain, that is harder, but if, even for fake news, right? Like um, they are just reading some words and like thinking whether that is uh, correct information or fake information, they don't check the source or they don't like look where it comes from or they don't like if they want to believe, they just want to believe. I don't really, um, maybe people like that is completely personal opinion, but maybe people um, don't start behaving cleverly before something big happens. So maybe there will be a very like, big deep fake thing that will convince everyone in a very like a uh, dystopian outcome like the like the name of the talk right uh but it's, there will be something very like a uh, dystopian about deep fakes and like everyone will be fooled and that will have a bad outcome and then people start questioning people start using deep fake detection detection platforms not believing everything that their cousin shared etc so i i completely agree with richard that um yeah yeah like we can't we can't force everyone to use a defect detector or we can't uh, maybe like even in the longer term we cannot um, uh, uh, convince all of the content creators to use provenance techniques right because maybe they are doing good defects and they want to prove that they are doing good defects like we said like for uh, ar vr for 3d humans for digital humans we actually want defects they are useful but we can't actually convince maybe at the start everyone that they should use those provenance techniques, right? Um, similar to like, we cannot convince everyone to use the defect detectors. They want they will believe what they want uh, to believe. So in that case, I think uh, not the scientists like me in the technical side, but more like social scientists would have more um, approaches and more um, um, efforts to make everyone, everyone believe that that is something bad and they need to like uh, watch out for what they believe for. And this is a follow up for me, Greg, uh, just wouldn't it make sense to have some kind of service that a less technical person could submit a video to to say, I'm curious, is there a fake here? And then and maybe the, the web service could run the deep fake detection or if it already has, it said, yes, we already checked it and it is kind of like having a list of known deep fakes or check new ones. Um, I wouldn't know how to you know pay for it or set it up, but just something that uh, a general person on their cell phone could ask for a check. Yeah, exactly. You are looking at it, right? This is web-based. This is not like an app or something. There is a um, address. It is not public right now. It hopefully will be. But there's a web address. You go there. You upload your video and see whether it's fake or not in real time. That's it. You don't need like if you can Google something or if you can like click on a link, then you can do this. Like just like uploading you like a, uh, upload, uploading a video uh, to YouTube or to Facebook, right? And you okay. can see that. And even what is better than that would be like um, maybe the user doesn't need to do it. like the user should do it. That's that's not like um, in question. But maybe the social media or like the, the video sharing platform should have that as a must before processing each video. Like whenever I'm uploading something to YouTube, it will go through this check, and maybe it will have a like a check there saying that this didn't have any fakes, or um, it has fakes between minute two and three. And after that, it doesn't have fakes, etc. So we are um, in conversation with some of those like uh, video uh, platforms and uh, like um, media providers about how we can integrate this into their pipeline so that like the users actually, um, without them doing like without them even like uploading something, they can see whether it is fake or not. It seems like it'd be a nice thing to pitch to YouTube or Facebook to add something like that into their service as things get uploaded, they do an immediate face check as it comes into the system, as opposed to people asking when they're viewing. Um, exactly, exactly. Um, a question from Edward Kukla. Many years back, when people tried to protect their visual image copyrights, there was a process to watermark images. Some use defects from the lens and the camera, pixel defects, to do this. Can, quote, watermarks be used to determine which video slash photo is real and which is fake? I, this is related to one of the earlier conversations. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, just as I said, like um, when we are dealing with like non-watermark videos, 
um, the biological signals that we are looking for, actually the watermarks that we as humans already put there implicitly, right? Um, and of course, like as previous, uh, like uh, referring to my previous answer for a question, um, in future we want to we want GANs to be able to add some implicit watermarks to whatever that they are generating, so that when we need to um, authenticate a fake image. We know its source, we know where it came from, we know the edit history, etc. So we actually want, um, not in a classical way as a watermark, but we want GANs to have an integrated watermark system that they can automatically, like whatever is generated from there, from like, I don't know, like my GAN, Ilke GAN, uh, it has its watermark from coming from, from which model it, it is generated from. Okay. A question from Richard Chang. Uh, blockchain the video question mark <laughs> about, uh, you know trying to have authentication um, so you know probably some kind of checksum or other attributes that it hasn't been messed with I would assume is what he means I guess so yeah um, yeah of course like there are other there are many approaches that we are um, looking um, again like um, these are all questions related to the provenance side of, of the project, which is not, um, which is still baking. <laughs> um, so I hope to share more information about that in, in maybe 2022. Okay. And then uh, from Carl Anderson, I was expecting some deep fakes for the 2020 election, but the most notable ones I recall were just adjusting the speed of the video and maybe a little compositing. Why wasn't there more? I mean, not that you would know why there weren't more attacks, but do you have any thoughts on it or from any of your reading or background? Um, again, like I am not a... Uh, uh, were you aware uh, there was more checking or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we saw some of them like with like slow motion or like with like, again, like videos with different caps or different uh, like like fake news uh, kind of things. Uh, but uh, for the videos, I think maybe, I don't know, I'm not a, a, a political scientist, you know, maybe there are some in the crowd, they can like voice their opinion. Uh, but maybe they are not as uh, tech savvy people to create as much like the supporters of whichever uh, politicians, they don't have enough motivation to create defects or maybe to like uh, put them out enough. I don't know. Um, so but yeah, that's a that's a that's a true observation. I haven't seen much deep fakes either. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom Moran, one of our volunteers, read a question from a YouTube person, uh, from William uh, Passam, who's saying, "Suppose you use GANs to generate genomic information like DNA, RNA sequencing. Can any of these cheap techniques be used to detect the fakes?" Oh, um... I'm not quite sure what where you get the genetic information of people, but. Um, I'll, I'll let you comment. Yeah, I don't think either. Like the most imaginative answer I can come up with is that can we actually relate any visual information to any DNA, then use that as the um, detector, use that in the detector? Now, I don't think that is much possible. Um, at you least, could, like you'd maybe you'd have yeah. to have a separate model to go from. Uh, the genetic gene encoding to the genetic expression. And that would be a huge separate model all in itself. And I, from the geneticist, I don't think that they're that far along. But exactly. I, I'm not a geneticist, so I won't speculate. Yeah. If we have any geneticists want to work on deep fake detection, find me. <laughs> uh, another question from YouTube, Alani Chrisman. Would it be more reliable to have cryptographic watermarks? on the true videos direct from the camera instead of on the fakes. And, and I yeah, think that's, that's kind of what we've been, you've been mentioning before, but go ahead. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, of course it would like um, to authenticate reels is easier than authenticate the fakes. If we have uh, access to all cameras, all camera manufacturing, all capture devices in the world, right? We would put like um, that like little cryptographic uh, watermark on like all the Mac cameras, all the iPhone cameras, all the. But you can't do that. There are like digital like there there is like very like old machines that doesn't have that. Like there is like I don't know very um, small computing platforms that wouldn't be able to put those into the crypto into the um, uh, 
into the photographs that are maybe even like non-digital versions, right? Like you have what happens if it is like a, a photo of a photo, right? In that case, it wouldn't have that, but the digitally it wouldn't have that, but it would still be the same photo, which is, is it real or a fake? Like photo of a photo is a fake or a real? So there are all those questions. And um, like in theory, if we have access to all the hardware, all the capturing hardware in the world, then that would be maybe easier. Uh, but now that like, uh, of course, if you look at like all the videos in the world, tapes are a much smaller percentage of all the videos in the world. So maybe it is much, a, much more a controllable, controllable, per, controllable, controllable process, sorry about that, um, to do something about the new fakes than doing like something for everything in the real, in, for all the videos in the real world. I think that uh, caught us up on all the questions on the chat. Um, the last one I was going to bring up is earlier, uh, before we started the talk, you were, I was asking you about the other talks you do, and there was one that you were surprised wasn't in as much demand, but you thought it was good. Would you like to give a little bit of a description to the audience? Maybe we could uh, talk to you about following up with that. In a, a yeah, of course. I actually have a nice teaser slide. Do you have like, uh, any intro slide or two on, on the other talk? Yeah. you want to give us a preview or? or a teaser? Yeah, of course. Um, so this is Intel Studios and you can see it is huge, right? Um, not it's only like spatially huge, but we are capturing 270 gigabytes per second of visual data. And all of that visual data mm -hmm. is actually used for all of these um, AR, VR movies in 3D. So this, for example, uh, this is captured in 3D, as you see here. Like everything is captured in 3D. There is no like you can stop and put the camera wherever you want. So this is all done. Uh, this is like volumetric filmmaking in 3D, um, and um, we so have um, perspective remapping to have simulated camera locations um, and stop motion at any position and time. I, this is like, um, the camera is put afterwards. This is all shot in 3D, just like here, right? And this is just one of the cameras. So we have um, 100 cameras here, which is creating that volumetric filmmaking. So you can even, uh, so you will see here, like um, you can view the world in uh, here maybe. Maybe it's not here. Anyway, you can view the world in the eyes of the horse, for example, which you wouldn't be able to put cameras in the eyes of the horse, right? That's, that's um, what I meant by perspective remapping for a virtual camera location. Right, right, right. So yeah, uh, when, when you are doing like one magic filmmaking, you can put your camera anywhere. You can uh, direct however you want. You can watch from anywhere you want uh, with all the details. Or you can like do, oh, sorry. Oh, actually, I can give you the teaser. It's even here. Let's let's look at the teaser. This is Intel Studios. It's one of the kind of video means you experience a look at human performance that you won't see anywhere else in the world. So it looks very interesting. Maybe I could talk to you offline and we could find a time like uh, after Thanksgiving, a couple of Mondays after Thanksgiving, if you're available on a Monday night like this. Of course, of course. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, all, all the talk is about like how we can actually use like AI in 
in, in, in the context of that such big data and intrigue. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. It's very interesting. It's awesome. Uh, we have to figure out a way to better share, share applause on Zoom. We haven't figured that one out yet. But if you have any suggestions, let us know. <laughs> so thank you for your talk. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It was a very interesting crowd. Um, like uh, all the questions I really appreciate. And if you have more questions, you can always feel free to reach to me. And thanks again for the invitation. Yeah, thank you very much. And this is San Francisco Bay Area ACM signing off.